Um, I never thought I was going to come back and be able to speak to, um, you know, students from Florida A&M University where I learned so much, not only about the law, but about the passion to serve those most in need. Um, my story is kind of weird. Um, I lived in Puerto Rico. I grew up in Puerto Rico. Um, I had no interest in the law. I was always active in politics, but then I saw uh, an internship flyer at my undergraduate college for an internship in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, in U.S. Congress. So um, I, I applied. Uh, thankfully, I was accepted. And, you know, during my participation in D.C., I was able to fall in love with how the law is made through the legislative branch. When I returned to Puerto Rico, I landed me a job uh, with the Puerto Rico Senate, went through the political route for years. Uh, 2011, um, 2012, I'm sorry, I applied to the White House internship. Um, and a friend of mine encouraged me to do so. I thought I had no chance of doing, of getting in. And luckily I was accepted. And um, I did an internship in the summer with um, Vice President Joe Biden. Um, but it wasn't until I got a little tired of politics and, you know, the co constant mudslinging, I got a little tired of that. So I said, you know what, I think my true calling is the law. Um, so I, I, every once in a while, you know, I go on a show here and there just to give my thoughts about politics. But my true passion right now is to help those within the, the criminal uh, justice system. And, um, that's uh, basically then I moved um, from Puerto Rico due to the economic crisis on the island. I'm sure most of you have heard. I was forced to move here with family in Florida and destiny brought me to, to FAMU. And it was a great, great experience. Um, I fell in love with uh, the school's motto of helping those most in need and uh, dedicating yourself to public service. And um, destiny brought me to Professor James Smith. So. I, I want to let all of you know that you're all very lucky to have uh, Professor James Smith as your trial practice professor. He's a great mind to pick, and I encourage you to ask a lot of questions. As you all know, he's very funny, um, but you're going to learn a great deal uh, about him. So yeah, then uh, after I graduated, I uh, applied to the Public Defender's Office. Um, many of them had hiring freezes. So the only one that I got a call back was Volusia County, met with the public defender, who the elected public defender, James Purdy. He said, what do you know about appeals? I said, barely anything. He said, great, you're the guy for the job. Um, so I was able to just jump in and, and learn while you go. And that's basically the nature of the being a public defender. And I've learned a great deal and I love it. So that's pretty much in a, in a nutshell. So Philip, the students actually, uh, in anticipation of you coming, put together some questions and they always like to write the questions and then I steal them so I can sound brilliant. So the first question is from Ms. Vaughn and here's the question. Clearly there's a gap between what you learn in law school and practice. So imagine, for example, without giving away spoilers here, it's like the new movie Tenet and you could go back in time what would you say to your 1L self so you could make sure that there's not that much of a gap between the degree and practice? I think what I would tell myself is try to get more in contact with practicing attorneys. Um, be that little bee in their ear, bothering them to like, can I tag along and watch you do what you do in court? Uh, because unfortunately in law school, they don't, they don't teach you that. And I've always envisioned myself being in, in trial practice or practicing obviously in litigation. So that would explain why I love trial practice and I love Professor Smith's class um, because I was hungry for that practical knowledge, which as all of you know, there's not much of in law school besides trial practice. Um, but not only that, pre-trial, I think a course on effective negotiations when you approach state attorneys, it is important. Um, so that's what I would tell myself. I would tell myself, uh, in my case, it was a little more difficult because I had to go to school at night. Um, but if you have the opportunity or you know anybody who's an attorney, um, I, Professor Smith, uh, you know, he teaches at night, but he's a practicing attorney. Just tag, ask them to tag along. You can just sit in court and watch them. And, and I learned a great deal just by watching other attorneys. And I still do that today. 
All right, so thank you. Excellent. All right, Ms. Vaughn actually now wants to violate the rules and ask her own question. Go ahead, Ms. Vaughn, though. Actually, I was continuing my earlier question that you, you just posed. So um, what about attorney, you said you want to accompany people in court. What about attorneys um, who do transactional work? Like if you're looking into that, they're not going to court. So how do you say approach attorneys in that way? That's a very good question. Um, uh, I wouldn't know the answer to that because I've never done transactional, but I would assume that you know, you can probably reach out to a transactional attorney and ask them how their everyday day-to-day -day goes um, so you can have an idea of the things that you may have to focus on to, to get ahead of the game, you know? And I believe that, you know, becoming an effective attorney is getting ahead of the game. Um, and if you can get ahead of the game in law school, that's easy. And Philip, to uh, build on that and Ms. Vaughn, let me, let me tell you this. One of the cutest things I think I ever saw, probably about four years ago, there's a lawyer who does a very specialized area of law and the only court this lawyer is going to see is if the lawyer goes to a basketball game, okay? And I saw the lawyer one day and he goes, you won't believe this one. There's a law student who says that she wants to do this area of law and she reached out to me on LinkedIn and asked if she could go out to lunch with me. I didn't think there was anyone who wanted to do this area of law. I'm so excited. She ended up getting one of the greatest mentors ever. Right, three things you can count on with regard to lawyers. Number one, we love to talk about what we do. I mean, we really love to talk about what we do. The less people give us opportunities to talk about what we do, the more that we want to talk about it. So there are a lot of transactional lawyers out there who certainly would love to give of their time, right, to talk to you. The second thing I would recommend is that you take a look at um, the state bar sections. There are a number of sections and they offer students the opportunity to be able to join and go to the luncheons or the meetings, okay? And then the third thing that I would say to you is this, you'd be surprised how many judges who are on the bench come from backgrounds that are unconventional. There are judges who are on the bench, but before they got on the bench, they did things like securities law, bankruptcy, what have you. Most, I think it's fair to say, right, Philip, of the judges usually don't have trial or criminal law backgrounds. Most of them come from corporate or transactional backgrounds. So if you reach out to them, if there's anyone who likes to talk about themselves more than lawyers, it's judges. So, you know, you got an amazing opportunity to be able to, especially here in this area with the federal courthouse and the Ninth Judicial Circuit, you know, just right across the street to really reach out and to talk to some people. All right. I think Professor uh, Smith is right on. Um, most of the appellate judges I've noticed so far don't come from trial experience at all. Um, most of the trial judges happen to be former state attorneys, which I believe that has to change. And I'm pleased to see um, many former public defenders getting elected to the bench. So we need to continue that, but yeah. Absolutely. So Ms. Maisel's question was quite an interesting one. Uh, and the question was, uh, Mr. Arroyo, I had a chance to look at your background and I see that not only were you a law student, but you were also a father and you're now a husband. In practical real world terms without platitudes, how do you balance the sometimes soul sucking job of being a criminal defense attorney so that you can still have enough emotionally for your wife and your family? That's a very, very good point. I've heard many horror stories from colleagues within the criminal defense realm where it's so time consuming that it affects their relationship. I guess I've been blessed in a sense that my wife is also an attorney. Um, she's an environmental attorney, but she's also a professor at Rollins College, so she understands more. Um, but even in that case, it's, it's hard, you know, and, and I think it's very important to take time um, for your loved ones, for your wife, your, your partner. It's very important, not only for them, but also it's very important for yourself and your mental health as well. Um, something that Professor Smith has always stressed, uh, always stressed to us when we were taking his course was, it's very important to do meditation, um, mindfulness, um, all of those things. Um, Cause you don't want to sacrifice those that you most love for this profession. Um, I'm sure everybody would agree that family members and loved ones are more important. 
Um, so I would just, what I do is at the end of the day, I always try to allocate time to be with my wife and just do nothing law related. We cut the conversations. We agree we're not going to talk about nothing about the law. <laughs> um, and we just like watch basketball games together, play around with our dog. Um, we, we were getting into the habit of sometimes getting out of work and talking too much about the law. And that we noticed, we were like, wait a minute, like we're out of, we have to disconnect. So it's very important to disconnect and um, allocate that time with your loved ones because it's very important for your mental health. That's why the Florida Bar, I'm sure many of you have read that the Florida Bar has resources now for mental health because it's a very, very um, a big problem within the profession. So that would be my, my two cents. All right, thank you, Philip. All right, Miss Mark's question is quite a unique one. And it's about the relationship between writing and trial work. And the specific question is this, a lot of people think that there is perhaps a divergence between being a good writer and a trial attorney. But my belief is that in order to be a good trial attorney, you really have to work on your writing skills. Do you agree with that? And how have you used that principle in your practice? Well, that's interesting you mentioned that because since I started off in appellate, it's more writing briefs. And I actually have an oral argument set for October 22nd. I'm not sure if I, I can see merit to that, to that thought. Um, I, I, I was able to vastly improve my writing um, when I was, um, well, I'm still, I'm a sort of like a hybrid trial attorney and appellate attorney. So I would say that your delivery in trial and the way you address the court is enhanced um, through the writing process. At least, you know, everybody's different, but for at, at least for me, when I write out arguments uh, to the appellate court, it for some reason sticks to my head and, I'm at, and I've been able to deliver a better vocabulary, a better delivery to the court at the trial level. Um, so I can see that being beneficial, absolutely. Um, but I think it would be more, even more beneficial um, to do the power of the pen in the appellate, uh, at the appellate level. And obviously when you want to convince um, the judge, uh, your writing skills with motions is, is absolutely crucial as well. Um, so yeah, I can, I can definitely see the benefit to that. All right, thank you. Mr. Borges' question is quite interesting. As you know, he has a flair for the dramatic and is into the arts. And so his question for you is, what is your favorite courtroom drama movie and why? Wow, my favorite courtroom drama movie. Um, I, I think um, I've talked about this Professor Smith on Facebook with you. Um, the Professor Smith is always like sharing uh, legal movies on Facebook. I, I love uh, the movie JFK with Kevin Costner. I'm not sure if all of you have seen it. Obviously, uh, I'm going to step away from the cliche. You know, everybody loves My Cousin Vinny, A Few Good Men. Uh, I like those movies too, but I really liked uh, Kevin Costner playing the prosecutor uh, in the movie JFK. Um, his closing argument at the end um, trying to prosecute the people who allegedly entered into a conspiracy to assassinate John F. Kennedy was, was amazing. It's always impressed me. But I would um, really encourage all of you to seek those legal movies, um, watch it, uh, seek that inspiration. A good appellate movie is um, On the Basis of Sex, which is the, the biopic of RBG. It's fascinating. And, you know, a, a lot of the the legal movies are, are you know, uh, trial, trial based. Um, but that movie was really good because it actually gave you an inside perspective of, of what appellate practice looks like. Um, so anything that, that inspires you, I would definitely invite you to, you know, try to channel that inspiration uh, by watching movies. They're, they're really, um, sometimes I do it before going to court. It just pumps me up, you know. Excellent. So Mr. Maynard has two questions. I'm going to start off with the legal one and then I'll save the secret uh, non-law related question for after you give your answer. Uh -oh. The legal question is this, when you first get a file for trial, take us from A to Z. What do you do? 
Wow. Well, the first thing you do, um, and unfortunately due to COVID, the trials are at a halt, but I heard some rumors from the judge today that they may come back late October. The first thing we do is, you know, we have an intake office. We um, get the file. The first thing I do is I look at their priors. Uh, for some reason, I just like to look at their priors so that I can know what I'm working with. Then I go through the police report. Um, the initial police report is key at trial. You're looking for any holes, any potential um, motions to suppress you can file, um, any potential motions to dismiss as well. Or um, in that case, uh, once you do that, after I do that, I contact my client. So then we have an appointment, we meet on Zoom nowadays. Um, we meet, I go over the police report, go over that person's priors, tell them um, what the legal strategy is and trying to submit mitigating information to the prosecutor to hopefully get the charge either dismissed, which is rare, um, or um, bumped lower to, let's say, a misdemeanor or maybe a withhold adjudication. And that's where the negotiation, the negotiation starts with the prosecutor. Now, it all depends. Um, I've had reasonable prosecutors. I've had salty prosecutors. Um, some of them, uh, some of the reasonable ones have been there for years, so they're willing to work something out. Some of the new ones tend to be, you know, cowboys and cowgirls, and it's a little harder to negotiate. After that, if there's still no reasonable or acceptable negotiation that serves the best interest of your client, then uh, basically you, the court sets it for trial. Um, so that's basically the, the process. Um, unfortunately, as many of you know, within the criminal justice system, um, many of the, uh, the poor and the needy are the ones who are most forced to go to trial. Um, most people within the upper middle class or even the middle class, lower middle class, usually plea out. So there's times where I've had clients who have basically nothing to lose. They've had two or three felonies and they're willing to go to court and I'm willing to fight for them. Um, and the, on the other hand, there's been people who are very, you know, no criminal record, no criminal history. You run into an unreasonable uh, prosecutor and that person gets caught in the criminal justice system and you have no other choice than to fight for them because they're willing to go to trial. Um, so that would be um, the process. If I missed anything, I'm a little exhausted today, but I'm, I'm per sure Professor Smith can give you a more vast explanation. Um, but that's basically what I do every day. Oh, no, that's, that's extremely, extremely helpful. Um, Julian, his second question was, uh, you claim to be a smart, dedicated, really insightful person. So how in the world can you be a supporter of the Orlando Magic? <laughs> Well, I got to say, man, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a Magic fan since 1989, okay, since Scott Skiles. So, you know, I like to keep it real. I, I like to um, be loyal because you got a lot of bandwagon fan, fans out there. Uh, you know, when LeBron's winning and Dwayne Wade was winning in Miami, everybody was a Miami fan. I, I stay loyal, you know. Uh, we're, we're there. I'm there in the good times and the bad times. So I'm looking forward to the future. All right. Outstanding. So we know it's been a long day. We definitely appreciate your time. Uh, all of you guys are too young to remember the original host of The Daily Show, a guy named Craig Kilborn. And he became famous for a little segment he had called Five Questions, sort of five rapid fire questions, somewhat humorous, but hopefully insightful. So Philip, we're gonna start off with five questions for you. And so question number one, here you go. Least favorite class in law school. Least, Least favorite, favorite contract. contract. Exactly. All right, all right. Definitely, definitely, definitely. All right, number two. Honest word and phrase you said the day you passed the bar exam. When you found out you passed, what did you say? Because I can tell you what I said, but it's actually not safe for Zoom. So I was, you just took the words out of my mouth. I can't say it here. All right, all right. Beep. Go back to law school. Class that you would have taken that you didn't take. Uh, family law. Family law and immigration, because unfortunately I was a night student and I just continue to have conflicts, but yeah. All right. Um, 
if you were not a lawyer, you would be a? Probably a journalist. Yeah. All right. And then question number five, if students want to reach out to you and tag along, be that be in your ear, how can they reach you? Um, you can reach me at my email. Um, you can look for me on Facebook as well, Philip Arroyo, P-H-I-L-L-I-P, Arroyo, A-R-R-O-Y-O. Or you can send me an email at parroyo.law at gmail.com. I'd be more than happy to help you with, it, with anything you need. Well, listen, Philip, I really truly do mean this when I say that, you know, I have a really high standard for the people that I will have and come and talk to the students, you know, not just because most of them are pretty much sleepy by the time we start this class, but also too, because I want to make sure that I give them access to, you know, people who exemplify the highest standards of the College of Law and Practice. So, you know, you probably don't know this, but for quite some time since, you know, your first day of law school, everyone knew that you were going to end up here. And this is just the beginning. Amazing lawyer, but even better person, great father, great husband. And so I really do appreciate you taking the time. And um, the next time you come, we'll show the video of uh, me breaking your ankles on the court when we were playing one on one. <laughs> bring it, bring it. <laughs> uh, again, it's, it's a pleasure and I'm really honored, Professor Smith. And, and again, I have to repeat it before I leave. You all are very lucky to have this professor. Too kind. Ms. Mark actually has a question for you. I just have okay. a quick question. So you said you were a part-time student. So how did you study for the bar and what bar prep program did you use? Oh boy, you're going to make me endorse a uh, bar prep program. <laughs> well, um, I, I'm going to be honest. Uh, it took me a couple tries to pass the bar actually. And if it happens to you, God forbid it does, don't lose faith. Um, this is a very, very difficult exam. And I know Professor Smith is very vocal about that, about looking for other alternatives. Um, it was hard for me, you know, if you're a night student, you're going to have to work twice as hard as anybody else. Because remember, in the bar exam, it's not you against the exam. You're actually competing with others as well. Um, so if you really want this, I would urge you to work twice as hard. Um, and just always imagine that there's somebody working harder than you. And uh, you'll be there. But it is possible. It is possible. I, I can attest to that. I'm an example. So keep the faith. Sir, thank you so much. We really do appreciate it. I'm going to let you go ahead and sign off now. Everyone, let's go ahead and give him a great silent Zoom applause. You know how it is. All right, Rattlers, give him hell. And you know what? We're going to get you uh, back towards the end of the semester when we're doing some of the mock trials. We'll have you be a juror or a judge. That would be an honor. It's been an honor to, to speak with all of you. Well, we've got the little virtual background, so you can come and it looks like you have a little uh, you know, robe there and <laughs> a little Orlando magic thing there. So I, I should have worn my Orlando magic tie, but next time, next time. Well, you couldn't find it just like they can't find their game. So oh, all right. Okay. Well, we'll talk later. We'll talk later. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, sir. It's an honor. Have a good one.